What's up everybody? Welcome to Breaking Biotech. My name is Matt and I'm excited today to talk to Dr. Robert Foster, who is the CEO of Hepion Pharmaceuticals. Robert, thanks a lot for being with me here today. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm excited to talk to you because I have had an interest in Nash for quite a while now. And I think I did actually cover your company very, very, very briefly. Um, and it was probably <laughs> early on in, in clinical development. But uh, I think what first might be best for us to talk about is, do you want to give us a little bit of a brief primer on Hepion, talk a little bit about cyclophilins and why they might be important in NASH? Sure. Uh, so Hepion, it's a company that's headquartered in Edison, New Jersey, and we have uh, R&D facilities, laboratory in other words, <clears throat> excuse me, in Edmonton, uh, Canada. And um, we've been working on um, cyclophilin inhibitors for forever. I mean, personally, I've been working on them since 1988. Sort of gives you an indication I'm, wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting up there. Yeah. Um, but um, what I guess what sort of got me first interested in working on cyclophilin inhibitors is um, my first drug, which is called Rockosone, which is probably only just a few months away from hopefully FDA approval for lupus nephritis. Mm -hmm. Um, that sort of got me going and that, that's a company I started in 1993, but more recently, um, relatively speaking in 2014, I started uh, another company to work on psych just purely cyclophilin inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And, um, to that extent, we, we initially started in the antiviral space. So we were looking at hep B, hepatitis C and HIV. Right. And then more recently, of course, with the COVID pandemic, we started looking at coronavirus. Uh, but really, I think honestly and earnestly in 2016 is when we really kicked off a, a major program in liver disease mm -hmm. and, and NASH. And that's because the data was pretty much screaming at us saying that uh, we had really, really consistent and significant antifibrotic effects. So because of the antifibrotic effects, we thought whether it's a virus that induces liver disease or whether it's alcohol, Mm -hmm. or whether it's fatty liver or NASH, all of those things, all of those, basically those roads all lead to Rome. And in this case, Rome being the fibrosis. So we thought if we have a direct acting antifibrotic, you know, let's go after that. So since about 2018 until now and, and continuing on, we're, we'll be chasing down uh, fibrosis and, and really NASH fibrosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the things that stuck out to me is you, you've done a lot of work with a lot of preclinical models. I feel like most companies don't have this much of kind of a banked amount of preclinical data before they move into the clinic. Yeah, we've done a ton of work preclinically, and I think it's it's probably for two reasons. I mean, one is you're a small company, and so when you're a small company, you're publicly traded, there's a lot of things that investors want to see. They want to see activity. Yeah. Uh, if they don't hear anything, it's just crickets in the background. I think it scares a lot of people and worries a lot of people at what's with that company. <laughs> so I think there's a there's that element as well. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think we wanted to know if this drug uh, or drug candidate, in this case, the CRV 431, mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to see if it has legs. Right. And one of the ways to figure that out before you start almost like wasting time, effort and money um, and, and, you know, going back and forth to the investment banks, investors um, to fund your clinical programs is to look as thoroughly as you possibly can on a preclinical basis to see, again, if the drug has legs mm -hmm. and if the drug is um, showing a good safety profile or toxicology program. Right. Um, so we've done all that to be able to reassure ourselves, I guess, that we've got a, a really good drug here. Yeah, yeah, and that makes sense. And now, I guess I'm kind of like a bench top scientist originally, so I was always kind of curious about how um, this thing could have an effect both in viral infection as well as in fibrosis. And I get that, you know, the fibrosis side, seemingly you're affecting the, the cells, the immune cells in the liver that could be producing these um, extracellular matrix proteins or things like that. But when it comes to viral infection, is the mechanism again on the immune system or is it actually in the viral uh, effects on the immune cells? Yeah, almost like neither, really. Um, so we do know that there's 17 different cyclophilins in, in humans. Right. And um, there's probably three, three or four key cyclophilins that we've been looking at and studying extensively for, I would say, the better part of 30 years. Um, so the one called cyclophilin A, which is, you know, the cyclosporine at one time is sort of tapped into that as well. But 
Um, I should say at the very outset that CRV-431 is not an immunosuppressive drug. Mm, um, so okay. it's not really um, so much an immune, well, I, I, I guess there is an com immune component to it. But anyway, cyclophilin A um, has some roles that um, we've been able to tease out. So for example, uh, we know the cyclophilin A binds to pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, for example, CD147. And that, that has a role in inflammation. Mm -hmm. And if we can dial back the inflammation, hopefully we can dial also dial to some extent, we can dial back the, um, you know, the, the, the injury to, to the, you know, the liver and other, other organs, but, um, cyclophilin A also binds, uh, to nucleocapsid mm -hmm. and to non-structural protein one. So there is a, a role for it to play in, for example, coronavirus, but also a role for it to play in hepatitis B, mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's basically the binding of the cyclophilin A to the nucleocapsid, I guess, in a gotcha. nutshell, that's, that's one of it, one of the, one of the things that it does, but on the fibrosis front, which is a different, you know, different indication altogether, mm -hmm. um, cyclophilin B actually plays a, a pretty big role there. So cyclophilin mm -hmm. B, um, plays a really integral role in the, uh, formation of a triple helix of collagen, which of mm -hmm. course is a protein that causes the scarring, right. um, in the liver. So that's one function of cyclophilin B. The other function is the cross-linking of collagen fibers, which happens through things like, for example, lysyl oxidase. So if you can knock out and you can experimentally knock out the role of cyclophilin B, you can see that you can actually really, really um, reduce significantly the formation of collagen and the cross-linking of fibers. Right. So there's right. Slight, different, slight different roles for the cyclophilins. Yeah, yeah, and that's actually pretty cool. Um, how that all is able to play out through the same, well, I guess, they're the same group of molecules, even though they're different isoforms. Um, yeah, and so, and obviously related to the collagen deposition, if you can affect that, then hopefully you can get rid of the fibrosis involved in NASH. And um, I guess related to your clinical programs in general, finish the single ascending dose trial in, uh, in NASH, or I guess, healthy patients. There's the multiple ascending trial that is finished. Um, we're, are we going to be seeing that data in the next little while? Yeah, in fact, um, that will read out before the end of this calendar year. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've finished the single and the multiple ascending dose studies in phase one. We've also done a, um, a I would say a fairly quick a drug drug interaction study we, mm. that um, that's also a phase one study so that'll all read out um, before the end of this year okay. and right at the present moment we're also in phase two uh, what we would call phase 2a mm -hmm. in NASH patients so of course the phase one program being in healthy volunteers and now the phase two is in NASH patients right and I think I just saw your updated um corporate presentation you're doing two doses for that phase 2a is that right 75 and 225 yeah that's right so the um we're, we, you know the low dose in this case is the 75 milligrams and and we have 75 milligram capsules so it's just one capsule okay and and uh we have also amended our protocol with the fda to move to 225 milligrams okay which would be you know uh, three capsules but i think there's a high probability that we'll also stick a middle dose in there at 150 milligrams. So mm -hmm. ultimately, I think what we want to see is a good dose response relationship. Right. And it makes sense to have the three doses instead of just one or two. Yeah. Yeah. That's exciting that you were able to get that green light from the FDA. And I think one of, one of the most exciting things about um, Hepion is that because the indication is so large for Nash that, you know, I think the, the market is trading right now at around $30 million market cap for Hepion. And yeah. comparing that to companies that have read out a positive phase 2A readout, um, you know, we're in the hundreds of millions in, in market cap for even kind of companies that have come as, as second tier, I guess, molecules. So I think uh, if we do see positive data, it would be pretty exciting for the company. Yeah, I think, I mean, generally my take on it is that what investors are looking for is they're looking for efficacy. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's really a phase two program. So the phase one program, you, it's, it's really important for us because it's giving us a lot of information. It's important from a regulatory standpoint as well. And it confirms a lot of things and it allows us to examine, a, you know, the pharmacokinetics or PK so that mm -hmm. one of the very fundamental questions we need to, we need to answer is, 
are the blood concentrations we're seeing in a phase one study in humans, are those roughly the same concentrations as we've seen in all of our preclinical efficacy models? Because if they're like way off, then yeah. you, know, you might have to reconsider what you're doing. But in this case, we're seeing that the, the concentrations match up beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, so what it's telling us is we have a lot of confidence that in our phase two program that we will see efficacy. So, you know, fingers crossed, it'll read out. Sure. Uh, well, let's start reading out towards the end of the year and then early into the next year. Mm -hmm. So you think we'll be able to see that um, 75 milligram dose before the end of the year? Yeah, that's what I'm two. hoping is. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm looking to get out some top line data before the end of this calendar year because, okay. again, at a low dose, if we see some good movement in some of the biomarkers, for example, mm -hmm. we're looking at collagen biomarkers and we're looking at liver function. And if we start seeing good readouts there, I think to your point exactly, if you look at comparable companies in phase two, these companies are several hundred million dollars. Yeah. You know, we're 30. So I think the upside is, is pretty substantive. And it's not like we're a bunch of uh, rookies or that this is our yeah. first rodeo. I mean, we've been doing this a long time and our team, every single one of our team members have been working on cycle films for at least 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we've done it once successfully before. Mm -hmm. So now I guess the question is, can we do it again? And I think the answer would be us. I'm betting yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. And, and yeah, and Nash is a, there's inter interesting things about Nash in particular that might make it a little bit more challenging. Um, I guess to, to switch to that, uh, talking about the Nash sector as a whole, you know, the, the FDA has released some, some draft guidance on what they want for uh, endpoints in phase two, phase three. But we did see that Intercept Pharma, they, uh, they had positive phase three data, and then mm -hmm. they submitted their application, and it got rejected. And I wonder what you think about uh, the difficulty from a regulatory standpoint when you get to these further trials, assuming, say, the phase 2A comes out okay. Is the FDA going to continue to move their goalposts? Are you going to be able to adjust for that, you think? Well, that's a, that's a massive, important question. <laughs> so um, when I look at the intercept data, and again, I'm not... I'm not you know, really intimate with the, with the data over at Intercept because I, I don't work there, but I can only go off what they've shown publicly. And then I can only go off um, what I see with the FDA and possibly also with European regulators. But mm -hmm. so the endpoints, like call it the goalposts, like, you know, you have to reduce the fibrosis score by mm -hmm. one point or, you know, with the FDA, or you have to have a resolution of NASH yeah. with, um, you know, no worsening of the, the fibrosis. So it's kind of like an either or, but in Europe, you need, it's, it's an and. So you need um, oh. a one point reduction in fibrosis score with no worsening of NASH, and you need oh. resolution of NASH with no um, worsening of fibrosis. So if I look at the, just again, on the surface of intercepts data, I look at it and go, well, I'm not sure how they're gonna fare in Europe because I, you know, they didn't hit the primary endpoint from a European standpoint. Hmm. From an FDA standpoint, because it's not an and, it's an or, they can say, yeah, we, we hit, we had a primary endpoint. But then when you look at it, um, they use two doses. They use the low and a high dose, call it 10 milligrams and 25 milligrams of obeticolic acid or OCA. Mm -hmm. And then they showed about a 23% response yeah. um, at the high dose and uh, about 17 or 18% at the low dose. But the placebo was about 12%. Mm -hmm. So now if you look at the delta between, or the, the difference, the efficacy rate of your response rate, whatever you want to call it, yeah. between a placebo and a high dose, it's only like 12%. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a bit worrisome. And I guess the other thing that I think, I think people have really de debated whether or not it's important is the side effect. So that yeah. a lot of patients are showing pruritus, you know, they, they itch. Yeah. And so to what extent is that troublesome? I don't know. Um, I do know, like, if I try to put myself in, a, in the shoes of a layperson who uh, just by chance find out that I have um, some liver disease, maybe fatty liver that could lead to NASH, um, because most of these people that, that have this are asymptomatic. So if I'm asymptomatic and I see a physician and the physician says, you need to take this drug called OCA at 25 milligrams, and oh, by the way, you might have an itchy pro itchiness problem. Yeah. So like, I don't know how I would take that drug because I'd be a little bit hesitant mm -hmm. to take something where I'm asymptomatic. Now I take something and I start itching. 
So that's yeah. that's just from a layperson perspective that I, I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's something to that as well as the injectables. I feel like people are very, can be very reluctant to take an injectable, even though a lot of the FGF data looks pretty good. Um, if it's an asymptomatic disease, I don't know how, how excited people are going to be to take injectable drugs um, for a disease they can't really see, can't really feel. I, I think that's exactly right. And I mean, one of the things that we've been thinking about since day one is, can we have an oral medication? Can we have it once a day? Um, you know, is it convenient? Do you have to take it, you know, let's say for a few months or weeks, or do you have to take a lifetime? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we tried to think about all these things before we sort of get into this. Um, and I think having a, a drug that's not an injectable, in our case, it's an oral once a day, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty convenient. And I think the other thing that's probably going to separate us out from most of the other companies working in NASH is that most other companies are working on the metabolic syndrome. So they're looking at how do you control fat and liver? How do you control diabetes? How do you control, you know, let's say uh, people from being overweight? You know, there's a whole bunch of these metabolic components um, that can lead up to the fibrosis, ultimately to fibrosis. So for example, when I hear other companies saying, well, we have an antifibrotic drug. The first thing I wonder out loud most times is, um, are they having an antifibrotic effect as a result of having a, let's say a, a reduction in liver fat, mm -hmm. a reduction in things like the comorbidities like diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, type two diabetes or insulin dependent diabetes, or, you know, being obese, are, are those things like hypertension yeah. feeding into the fibrosis or do you have a directly antifibrotic drug? Yeah. And so that, that's, that's where we fit in. I mean, we're yeah. truly an antifibrotic. Yeah. And I think there's, well, and, I guess given that the FDA, it's an it's an or question where you can either do one or the other. Um, I think that the fibrosis part is probably the more difficult one to hit. Just in general, I feel like once the extracellular matrix proteins are deposited, I feel like it's tough to kind of get those out of there. So if you can really hit the fibrosis program, it might be a bit easier to actually tackle the the Nash problem. But a lot of companies, you're right, have focused on the fatty liver disease. And I think for a lot of the phase 2A readouts, it's been specifically in NAFLD patients, and then they, they moved to biopsy confirmed NASH, or at least NASH presumed patients. Um, so do you, you think that'll be, uh, maybe make it easier for you to get into phase three because you're gonna be targeting that antifibrotic program? I, I think it's gonna make a world of difference. And um, it's interesting, we were, at the, we were in London at a NASH conference, it was actually a NASH summit. And um, it was a fairly small conference. I, I would say there's a couple hundred people only. Um, but we gave a presentation on the results of our drug. And one of the studies that we did was in, um, in, a, in the, actually conducted in the UK by a company called FibroFind. <clears throat> and what they did is they took four or five uh, human donors. And these were donors that had, um, I would say, all five probably had liver cancer. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they, as they're surgically removing a cancer, they took a healthy margin in the liver. Okay. And then they took those really, really thin slices of human liver explants. Mm -hmm. And then they um, stimulated fibrosis. And then they added test, test uh, drug, in our case, CRB 431. Right. And then what they did is after three or four days, they wanted to see, was there, that, was there a reduction in the fibrosis that was ob observed? Mm -hmm. in these human livers and the answer we got was yes it was actually a really significant reduction in the fibrosis so that was presented at the meeting mm -hmm. and then one of the people that was working over at um, the uk facility gave they also gave a presentation they talked about how they do these liver explants mm -hmm. and then um, during the question period there was a fellow from the fda who stood up and he said this is an amazing type of a test that you're using here why don't we use this test on all drugs in NASH? Hmm. And, and I mean, that would be a really good way to look at uh, liver fibrosis in human yeah. tissue. And the answer, the quick answer was, because none of the drugs work. <laughs> <laughs> and so this person actually tested the other, many other NASH drugs and actually said they don't work. Hmm. And so that really put a bit of a light on our company during that conference because, yeah. you know, ours clearly stood out and worked. So that was kind of cool. Interesting. Do you, can you tell us which, uh, which drugs he actually tried? 
No, I can't. I can't actually <laughs> tell you. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could, but I can't tell you which ones were actually tried. Interesting. Um, but it's a really cool technology, I can tell you that. Yeah, I mean, to get access to, to human liver like that is pretty um, fortunate. So I feel like those samples are, are very tough to come by. In my postdoc, super, we, um, we were lucky hard, yeah. to get, like, <laughs> uh, material that was, you know, it wasn't fit for transplantation. And, you know, so they kind of, like, keep passing it off to the next researcher. And we got access to some of it. But usually it's not without comorbidities in, in these patients. So Yeah, it's hard to find that healthy margin. It's got to pass a whole bunch of tests and... We did the same type of study using lungs. These okay. are IPF lungs, so idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Mm -hmm. and, and those are really tough to get. So they only typically get one lung per month that's usable. Mm -hmm. um, so we did a study in lung as well, and it worked. You know, okay. So that opens up another potential indication of IPF lung, which is yeah. virtually impossible to treat an IPF lung patient. It's really challenging. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's, uh, I guess, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. So you do have a COVID program. Um, and mm -hmm. then I think I saw, uh, hepatitis B, but seemingly if, if you can stop fibrosis in other organs, this could be a big molecule for all sorts of other things, but short term, you think COVID, um, hepatitis B? Well, short term COVID is probably going to uh, take precedent over hep B, um, sure. because it's just, it's just right now, it's such as it's just such a big problem that we're trying to, yeah. um, to help out with the hep B. Um, that was actually a strategic decision I made when I came on a CEO on, uh, October of 2018, I sort of looked across the whole space or spectrum of, um, hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I kept realizing is that, um, it's going to be a really, really tough, um, virus to treat. So hep C by comparison was pretty easy. Um, hep B is a much more tough nut to crack. And I think one of the reasons is that the, the hep B genome integrates into our own genome. Oh, really? So, so the problem there is that, um, well, one of the main problems with hepatitis B is of course the virus, but it's also, um, the fact that it exhausts your immune system. And the reason it exhausts your immune system is there's something called service antigen. It's basically these little decoys that the virus can pump out at massive huge quantities that are far in excess of what you see in a virus. Hmm. Um, but the problem is the, hep um, the hepatitis B surface antigen is actually produced from your, um, the piece of hep B genome that's incorporated into our own genome. Okay. So if we can somehow get rid of the hep B virus itself, yeah. it may not necessarily solve the problem of getting rid of the surface antigen, right. which is then going to continually beating up your immune system. But on COVID, um, yeah. You know, maybe that it might it might be you know a bit easier to to deal with the COVID. Right, right. Uh, yeah. So you think twenty twenty one maybe start something a little more um, further along in COVID? Yeah. So right now we did we did a couple of studies that are giving us a, some confidence that we may be able to to do something about the coronavirus too. Okay. Uh, one thing we did recently is we did some work with the NIH, mm -hmm. and um, they tested our CRV431 in, um, in vitro, and they use a specific cell line, and um, they tested our drug against their gold standard, you would call it, you know, the positive control. Mm -hmm. And we were about five times more potent than their positive control. So it tells mm -hmm. us, hey, we've got an antiviral, which is kind of cool because the literature actually also is saying that cyclophilin inhibitors probably can play a role against coronavirus and coronavirus too. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was, that was kind of cool to see that. But then we did another study just outside of Boston, uh, with another company. And what we did there is we induced, um, animals to have acute, um, lung injury. Okay. And then, you know, of course, everybody talks these days about dexamethasone and yeah. Trump's getting, you know, dexamethasone. Yep. And of course, the reason you're getting dexamethasone is to deal with like, almost like an overreactive immune system where you get these things mm -hmm. called cytokine storms. Um, so we went head to head in this study with dexamethasone and we were at least as effective as dexamethasone, but yet we're not a steroid. Hmm. So I don't think we're going to suffer those same down, yeah. I guess, potentially negative side effects yeah. of, of steroids. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. And, you know, it seems like it's, it's open season for, for COVID. There's tons of companies that have, you know, something they like to jawbone about it. But if there is something that stands aside from the competition, I think there could be. Uh, a lot of potential for that. 
And it's another one of those either ors because most people are looking at either treating the, the virus or treating the downstream effects of having the virus. And right. in our case, what's what we're, we're seeing is maybe ours is an and. You know, mm. we can treat the virus and we can treat the down, downstream effects. Yeah, that's true. And I don't think there's any, mo- well, I don't know. There's so many that are out there now. I'm not sure if any other molecules can really claim that. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't think of one. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, great. That's uh, that's awesome to hear. And I think the last thing I wanted to ask you about is your corporate presentation is a lot of talk about your AI platform. Can you, can mm-hmm. you speak to that? Yeah, I'm just, um, I, I'm actually getting a lot more familiar with it day by day because, um, you know, we're, we're a group of guys that, you know, I, I guess, you know, m- most people would look at us and say, well, these guys are hardcore science geeks. <laughs> so, but, but, um, and we've been doing this for such a long time, but one of our guys in particular who I've, I've, I've known probably, probably for 40 years, he's got the same education in terms of background as I do with, you know, having the PhD in pharmaceutics and whatnot, but he's also been writing code and, and working on AI mm-hmm. since the nineties. Um, so more recently, he's um, started working on AI for us. And this probably harkens back to what we were just talking about with OCA. So if your high dose is showing about a 23% response rate, just imagine if you're trying to commercialize that and the third party payers are saying, okay, assuming you get FDA approval, who's gonna pay for something that doesn't work in almost 80% of the patients? Yeah. What we'd like to try to do is to say, let's try and get an 80% response rate if mm-hmm. possible. Sure. And, and see if we can, you know, make it a smoother sailing, I suppose, between now and commercial commercialization. Mm-hmm. So to that extent, we're using omic analysis. So we're taking proteome, genome, mm-hmm. lipidome, met- met- metabolomics, transcriptome. And then we're taking all that data and we're laying it on top of what happens to, for example, the genome when you have NASH. Mm-hmm. So if you're driving hard towards fibrosis and NASH, what's going on with the genetic profile of those patients? And is there any way possible that CRV, for example, has an interaction on those exact same genes, maybe upregulating or downregulating? Something that will be beneficial so that we can say, before we go into a clinical trial, let's say phase two or phase three, mm-hmm. we know exactly who's going to uh, respond better to this drug, as mm-hmm. opposed to just throwing the drug at the wall and, and hoping something sticks. Yeah. And I feel like companies that are not able to find their right patient population are the ones that end up suffering with data that's not significant when if they were to be more selective, I guess, on the criteria, they, they might show significant data. So Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Interesting. And I guess the is are the data sets publicly available or are you kind of doing this work yourself? Yeah, so the, the AI is proprietary to us, but we are tapping into a lot of the um, publicly available uh, data. Um, so there's a lot of work that's been done and publicly available, but we're you know doing our own work and we've got guys writing code and playing around with all the numbers. And every time they flip the computers on, <clears throat> you know, our R&D office is located in Edmonton. I always joke that they flip the computers on, I can tell because all the lights dim in the one side. Of the <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I mean, that many different <laughs> omic data sets has got to be a lot of, yeah. uh, of information. Yeah, these are kind of a gazillion data points. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, hopefully it ends up uh, informing on, on decision, actionable decisions for, for your trials. Yeah, um, exactly. Great. So that's really all the questions I have for you today, Robert, and I appreciate you coming on the okay. show. If um, if anybody wants to find out, uh, Hepion's the company name, they can Google that and find out everything. Is there anything else you want to plug? No, I think I think that's probably got it. I mean, I love the cyclophilin inhibitors because... Um, they're so versatile, which is why I guess I've spent 30 you know, plus years working on them. And again, you know, the, the first one, Voclisporin, is going to be hitting hopefully market approval on um, January 22nd. Mm-hmm. And that first company I started, which is Arania Pharmaceuticals, mm-hmm. that company's done spectacular work. And it's only because of the current management and the current board that that is as successful as is because you have a great team in there. Yeah, that's true, and uh, I think I think I made some money on that personally. I was playing the, uh, the phase three trial and it ended up, ended up yeah. working out. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great company, and like I say, they've got a great team. Yeah, yeah, and they should be seeing. I I can't imagine the FDA wouldn't approve the drug given the data. So yeah, it's it's stunning. The data is stunning. It's so good. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is very cool. Well, uh, thanks again, Robert. I appreciate it. And the company is called Happy On. So everybody, check that out. And uh, with that, we'll see you next time, guys.